Good day chaps. So, today's quick video is going to cover one of the more unusual and unknown vehicle designs drawn up by the British in the Cold War. It's a missile toting, slow moving behemoth with frankly absurd levels of armour. This is the Overthrow main battle tank from 1963. This vehicle was drawn up by the British Aircraft Corporation's Guided Weapons Division in Stevenage, Hertfordshire. These guys normally stuck to missiles, notably their own rapier system, but they also built several others under licence or acquired them in mergers, such as the Bloodhound and Thunderbird from English Electric, the Vickers Vigilant under licence, and of course Swingfire, originally designed by Fairy, but later BAC. A missile they were particularly fond of, and over the following years they would try and stick this on just about every military bit of equipment by the regimental mascot. However, in 1963, they took another step in having a go at designing not only the missile, but the vehicles that would carry them as well, as cutting out the middleman seemed to be more lucrative. But the old saying, just because you can, doesn't mean you should, very much applies here, particularly if you don't have a track record in the design and development of very heavy vehicles. And the final result, while it showed some promise in a few areas, was more or less torn apart by those that inspected the plans and the concept for a series of colossal mistakes. So what was the vehicle and what did it offer? Well, I'm going to go over that, but also add the inspector's notes along the bottom, rather than doubling back on myself. And you can feel their growing frustration at some of the very basic oversights with overthrow. The Guided Weapons Division quoted that they felt the most important aspect of a tank was its ability to move under fire, and thus it required adequate amounts of armour, and that speed does not by itself offer sufficient protection. While the mobility versus protection question is a very fine art of balance, this vehicle decided to all but do away with any pretense of mobility, as we might be used to, with a top speed on the road of just 13 miles per hour. What they felt was needed was enough protection to withstand all and any weapon of the time, and to just shrug off those pesky Soviet guns as it waddled forwards. The particular threat of this era was the anti-tank guided missile, like the Soviet Saga, with up to 400mm of penetrating capability, able to knock out almost any tank of the time. And so they simply gave it more armour than any missile of the period could reasonably go through. To this end, they rationalised that 30 inches of steel would be required, or an equivalence of 762mm, roughly three to four times that fitted to most main battle tanks of the period. Yet they also realised that just pure steel would be adding in too much weight, but if they used multiple layers of glass and steel laminate in thin layers compacted down, this could work, with this composite having some 8 inches of glass and 6 inches of steel in total, this would offer the same effective value as 26 inches of steel. This pack would then be mounted onto a 4 inch armoured steel base for a total of 30 inches effective armour. And yet this would still be lighter than a solid monoblock round of steel. And at this time, almost no weapon devised was going through that easily. But okay, sure, massive amounts of frontal protection. But then you have to have weaker sides, right? No. The team were clearly on a roll here, and not wanting to allow something as obvious as flanking shots get in their way of bungling a perfectly good idea, they proceeded to add the same armour to the back and to the sides. So this thing had 762mm of protection all the way around it. On top of this, it has inches of polythene on the inside to absorb any radiation, as this vehicle was designed to survive near hits from atomic weapons. Well, I mean, that's as mad as a box of frogs. But could they add more? Well, of course they could. For they also felt weapons like Hesh rounds might damage the glass inserts over a wide area. Thus, she had a standoff plate of half an inch thick of steel, separated by another half a metre of spaced armour over the front and back, with the thick side skirts having a metre of spaced armour over the tracks, and even the roof of the vehicle being some six inches thick. But surely this thing is too heavy to move. Well, not really. And this is a good lesson on how much volume increases weight. The overthrow was very compact. Being just five foot tall, 
but also quite wide at 13 foot wide. Now, as you might have noticed, there's no turret, and we'll come back to the weapon system in a bit, as it's not just those two little odd machine guns that you can see. By removing the turret and reducing the crew to just two men in an armoured pod to the front, and similarly arranging the suspension system, they managed to get overthrow down to 65 tonnes. So you have a tank with nearly four times the thickness of, say, a tank like the mouse, at a third of the weight, by simply cramming everything down into a much smaller box, particularly around the crew. Of course, this did lead to problems. Well, what engine to use? And how to make sure the suspension worked? For the former, they chose to go with an 18-litre, supercharged, Alvis Leonides radial engine, considered as Britain's last high-powered production piston engine and one of the very few times that we ever considered truly using a radial in a tank. But given that the vehicle had a massive chunk of arm on the back, where were they going to put it? Well, this led to a few limited choices, and it would end up being fitted in the rear third of the vehicle with a gearbox built next to it. This engine provided three power modes. At base, it was 680 brake horsepower for 10.5 horsepower per tonne while the engine could be overcharged for 840 horsepower at 13.4 horsepower a tonne, but this could only be done for 5 minutes or less. Oddly, they also listed that the engine runs at 750 horsepower at 5,500 foot of altitude. The next issue was the tracks. In order to maintain the required 13 pounds per square inch ratio, they went with 26 inch tracks, but in the conventional layout, these were not long enough to give the best ratio and due to the vehicle's rear armour there was no way to put a sprocket at the back end and with the internal layout it couldn't go at the front and so having already thrown most common sense into the bin decided to place the drive sprocket in the middle upper centre in replace of one return roller. The rest of the suspension consisted of seven normal road wheels and a forward high idler the suspension itself was a torsion bar type separated between two half inch steel plates and mine protection. Now this led to a few more problems. The first going back to that two crew part. How to change the tracks? The side skirts weighed two and a half tons each, just the space plates. And the second and bigger issue was how to load the thing onto a wharf flat or railway for moving. As first the side skirts needed to be removed, then the side packs, at 15 tons each, but this still left it 13 foot wide and therefore it couldn't fit a standard NATO railway gauge with its tracks on. They had to then build a tripod frame that would fit over the hull, attached to the engine and form a rig. This would lift all the armour off the sides and then the tracks must be taken off and the vehicle used an inbuilt winch to haul itself onto a flatbed. This obviously raised a few more eyebrows. And then finally we have the weapon system. The designers argued that the conventional turret on a tank was the main issue, that it took up a lot of volume, space, and didn't have in their view the armour to withstand the hits needed, or the ability to fire high explosive rounds from behind cover, which seemed to have rustled a few jimmies. Thus they decided to go with a vertical launch system. Now this at least is one aspect that is not quite as mad, and it's been considered before albeit often on lighter vehicles. But there have been heavier platforms planned or considered, with both the US and the Soviets both drawing up ideas, and even today the concept comes up from time to time. The advantage of this layout is that the launcher system is entirely protected within the hull, but having the right missile is a tricky bit. However, on this front, BAC had a winner, the Swingfire missile, arguably one of the most agile missiles ever made able to turn 90 degrees within the first 1.6 seconds of firing, if not faster, and for the time, packed excellent anti-armour capability. The overthrow would have 18 tubes, or for an extra 2 tonnes, a total of 24 launchers could be carried. Each of the two crews, the commander gunner and driver gunner, had dual controls, and could fire their missiles in a 360 degree bubble, with 8 rounds per minute estimated although this depended on the range of the target. Thus the vehicle could, in theory, park behind a hill and fire a barrage of missiles at the Russians. Although one must ask, if you're going to fire from behind a defilated position, why do you need super heavy armour? 
when this could have also been done on a 432 or similar. For close protection, they decided to add remotely controlled machine guns, which they claimed offered anti-infantry capabilities up to 2,000 metres. Hmm. The Ford 7.62mm GPMG is mounted in a spaced armour array, and the back, an automated turret, could fire over the sides and rear, but not forwards, due to those two tank periscopes. And that gentleman is more or less overthrown in a nutshell. The plans and details were disseminated for review and the vehicle, as we've seen, was soundly slammed by just about everybody who read the papers. The vehicle had simply too many defects and issues to have ever gone anywhere sensible. And today, only a few documents survive covering the ideas. Although the vertical launch system and a few minor parts were passed along for further study, this marked the beginning and the end of the project. I hope you liked or found this bizarre vehicle of interest. Let me know your thoughts below. I would like to thank my Discord member, El Cell, for the lovely 3D model he's made of this vehicle and bringing it to life. Many thanks, fella. If you did like this or want more gubbins, hit that like or subscribe button and the notification thingy jig up there and join us on Discord for more odd tank chats. And until next time, toodle pip.